everyone, welcome back to Night Sky News for February 2019. There has been a lot of cool stuff happening in Space News this month, so we've got a lot to get through. So let's just jump straight in, feet first, into looking up. All right, so as in the previous months, Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter are all still visible in the night sky in the early morning and Mars in the uh, early evening sky as well. So make sure you look out for those. If you're not sure which one's which, there's a couple of conjunctions coming up this month that might help you to pick them out more easily. So a conjunction is basically when two objects in the night sky uh, line up kind of on the same sort of sky longitude and it makes them really easy to spot because they also come really, really close together as well. So on the 1st of March, Saturn is gonna have a conjunction with the moon. So that means that the moon is gonna pass about a finger's breadth higher than Saturn in the sky right before dawn. So the moon is gonna be this really thin crescent as well, so it's gonna be a really, really cool sight to see. Should just be able to see it here in the UK, although it will be quite low in the sky, so a clear horizon is gonna be key. But the further south you are, the better chance you'll have at spotting it. Then there's gonna be another conjunction on the 2nd of March as well, this time between the moon and Venus. And for this one, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to see it in the UK here. So the further south you are, the better. I'm talking like, you know, like south of Toronto to have a chance of seeing this. Um, and this is gonna be where the moon will pass around about sort of two thumb breadths away from Venus, below Venus in the sky the next morning as well. And again, it's gonna be a really, really slim crescent in the sky this time, just two days before new. So a really spectacular sight. So the 21st of March is actually the last supermoon of the year as well. So a supermoon is when the moon looks about 15% brighter and about 7% bigger in the sky so that when it's quite low on the horizon, it looks really spectacular and quite large in comparison to the other objects that you're seeing it nearby. Uh, this is because basically the moon's orbit isn't circular. So there are places in its orbit where it comes a little bit closer to Earth than normal. And when that coincides with the full moon, we call it a supermoon. Uh, quite sad that it's the last one of the year because they are spectacular, they do look beautiful in the sky, we won't see another one of those this year. But also at the same time quite happy because the media will stop hyping it up and probably calling it a super worm moon despite the fact that nobody actually calls it that in astronomy. All right, so that's it from what I think you should probably keep an eye out for in March in the sky, but let's come back down to Earth and chat about what's been happening in space news in February. So first of all, I wanna talk about the New Horizons flyby of Ultima Thule again, because it's been sending back more images and we've been finding out more cool things about this Kuiper Belt object. So you remember that there was the flyby on New Year's Day uh, in 2019, and it sent back that amazing image on its approach where the asteroid that it was approaching was fully lit by the sun and it sort of was like the snowman shape and they dubbed the, the head of the snowman Ultima and the, the bottom larger part Thule. I said at that point that actually it took so many images that it's gonna be sending images back for another two years, just as the bandwidth isn't long enough to send them all back at once. And we've got a couple of those now. So these images have come from when the spacecraft is no longer looking at Ultima Thule from the front sun facing side, but sort of from the side and back of Ultima Thule where the sun actually isn't lighting it up anymore. So you can't actually see anything technically in the image, but what you can see is the dark area where Ultima Thule is, where it's blocked the background stars behind it as a new horizons flies past. So what you can do is therefore trace out the outline of stars that are blocked to get an idea of what shape Ultima Thule is. So what they found when they pieced together that shape is that actually Ultima Thule isn't spherical like we thought, like snowman spheres, it's actually flat. So Thule is flat like a pancake and then Ultima, the smaller sort of top bit of the snowman's head is kind of more like walnut shaped. And there is a little bit of uncertainty on this because actually New Horizons spacecraft was traveling quite fast when it did this flyby. So obviously the stars in the background get kind of a little blurred and you kind of can't tell where the edges of the object necessarily are. But even within those uncertainties, it's still pretty flat. And it's weird. Like we still think that those two objects have come together to make Ultima Thule. Like they've, they've both formed separately, Ultima and Thule, and then collided quite slowly and come together. But how did Thule like form like as a flat pancake in the first place? Because it's such a weird shape for it to be. You know, most of our solar system formation models of like early solar system and, and tiny particles clumping together under gravity is that the most stable sort of shape they can be in is kind of a sphere because then gravity is sort of equal on all the surface. You know, and that'd be a perfect sphere, kind of lumpy, but this thing is like flat, which is like really weird. 
So solar system modelers are kind of going to have to refine their models and see what changes they can make to try and reproduce something that's weirdly this flat. So it's really cool. We have learned so much from New Horizons already from this flyby, and we've barely got a fraction of the images back already. Incidentally, the raw images are posted by NASA like every Friday from off the telescope in the data dump that it's got that week, and they are put online as well. So I'll post the link in the description below for all of those who want to have a, a little look at those images. So sticking with solar system exploration and asteroids, did you see that this Hayabusa 2 spacecraft had actually managed to touch down on the asteroid Rigu? So this isn't in the Kuiper Belt anymore like Ultima Thule, this is actually a near-Earth asteroid. So it got there in June 2018, this craft, and it was supposed to do this landing in October, but it was a little bit delayed uh, after its three and a half year journey from Earth because the surface of Ryugu wasn't uh, what they were expecting. It was a lot more rugged. There was a lot of boulders on the surface. It was quite craggly, really. And they were looking for a really nice sort of flat, open, large bit of space they could land in so that the landing would be a little bit easier. They were looking for sort of like a hundred meter wide plane that they could land in and they couldn't find it on the imaging that they were getting back from the surface. In the end, they managed to land on a six meter wide plane that they'd found, the flattest bit that they could find, which is an incredible feat, really. So what they've done is they've lowered the spacecraft down to the surface. They've fired a bullet into the surface, for want of a better word. They've fired a projectile into the surface, which has kicked up a load of the rock and dust on the surface and hopefully has managed to actually capture some of that rock and surface material in a canister to bring back to Earth next December 2020, which will be really, really exciting. Before it does that, it's also scheduled in about April time to basically detonate an explosive on the surface of this asteroid as well, in the hope that it will dig down and make a really big crater so that we can get a sample of rocks from the bottom of that crater as well. So you can get rocks from the surface that have been exposed to space and then rocks that have been sort of buried under the asteroid, you know, not seeing the light of day since the very early formation of the solar system. Now, NASA has a similar mission called OSIRIS-REx as well, which I talked about in December. That's going to the asteroid Bennu. Uh, and it got there uh, in December and is now doing that sort of image recon, trying to find a space to land on and then also to collect its sample to bring it back for about 2023. And so it's good that there's like two missions, Japanese and American-led mission, um, that are both trying to do the same thing because then they'll be able to compare results. Uh, Bennu is also a near-Earth asteroid, so they'll both be comparing um, the formation of these two separate objects, whether they were formed similarly or different for different reasons. And just to compare results, because that's what science is all about, really, isn't it? Is comparing and repeating experiments. The cool thing is that OSIRIS-REx will actually be able to tell if it's collected any of the particles that it finds. So the canister that it's gonna actually take all that rock and dust from the surface back to Earth with is actually gonna be on an arm on OSIRIS-REx. So what it will do is it will spin round that arm before it collects the sample and then after it collects the sample. And what it will do is it will measure something called the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is basically just like how easy or hard it is to accelerate something. And that all depends on, you know, how heavy the mass is at the end of the arm that you have. So if it changes before collecting and after collecting the sample, we'll know how much uh, sample of rock you've been actually able to collect from the surface of Bennu. Fortunately, uh, Hayabusa does not have this arm thing. It, it collects its sample very close to it. It's sort of very internalized. And so we won't know until it gets back in December 2020. So I am really excited for that. So sticking in the solar system, let's talk about Opportunity Rover because oh, I, I have to admit, I shed a little tear at my desk last week when I found out that it had been declared as mission over. Opportunity has been the most amazing rover to have on Mars. We have learned so much from it. You know, it touched down on Mars in 2004 and along with its partner rover Spirit at the same time, they were supposed to only last 90 days each. Spirit made it to 2010 and Opportunity to 2018, 2019. So if you remember, NASA lost contact with Opportunity in about June 2018 last year when a planet-sized dust storm engulfed Mars. And all the recordings we were getting from Opportunity were that its power levels were dropping significantly. That's because the dust was actually blocking out sunlight and so it couldn't get enough power from its solar panels to function as normal. So on May 8th, 2018, it recorded that it got 667 watt hours of energy from solar power that day. Whereas on June 10th, 2018, it only had 22 watt hours of energy uh, managed to harvest from the sun just because so much of it was blocked out 
by the dust storm that was engulfing this planet. These dust storms that are planet-wide happen once every three years or so. They're not your average dust storm at all. And they form just like storms on Earth do. So the sun heats the air like directly above the surface of the planet. That hot air rises and it does so it takes dust with it. And so every three Earth years or so, the conditions are right so that that storm actually escalates and it's a planet-wide system. And you can see the data from a lot of the satellites from around Mars recording the features on Mars before that storm engulfed it and after it. And you can see that it's basically just been washed out the entire planet. And so Opportunity, unfortunately, was stuck in the middle of that. So Opportunity was programmed so that if the voltage of its battery did dip below 24 volts, it would basically put itself into like low power mode, <laughs> I guess just like you do on your phone. Um, and basically it would turn off all like non-crucial systems and it would sort of go to sleep. The only system it wouldn't turn off was its internal clock. Uh, and every so often that clock would give uh, Opportunity a little signal to say, hey, wake up, have we got enough power to send a signal back to Earth? And if it didn't, it would go back to sleep again. And so this has happened before in 2007, both Spirit and Opportunity were caught in one of these planet wide dust storms, but thankfully they were able to be recovered a couple of months later after the storm had dissipated and they'd gone into hibernation mode just fine and managed to wake up out of it. This time however the storm abated in about October 2018 and then NASA waited a couple of months until the windy season on Mars, which was sort of November, December time, so that the wind would hopefully remove any uh, dust that was actually collected on the uh, solar panel's surface as well, so it would have had a long time to get clean and, and then also like absorb more energy to kickstart it again. So that period of time had passed and it was getting to sort of January, February and they wanted to try and wake up the rover again. So before February 13th, there had been over a thousand commands sent to Opportunity that had gone completely unanswered. And so at that point, NASA decided to declare that there must have been some critical failure with the mission. Presumably that the internal clock that gets left on, even when it's in that low power mode, had failed either because of extreme cold or possibly even because of the dust had got into the uh, system as well, because the dust grains are not like sort of sand grains. They're, they're really, really fine and they can really ruin your electronic systems. I mean, I know it was only supposed to last 90 days, so it's been absolutely incredible that it's managed to last 15 years instead. But I was extra sad because it means that that amazing XKCD comic about opportunity can no longer come true as well, which makes me extra sad. So it actually managed to travel more than 45 kilometers on the surface of Mars as well, which is further than every other Martian rover combined has managed to travel. It's actually further than a marathon. So maybe Oppie has actually earned its rest after doing a 15 year long marathon. <laughs> Okay, so my favourite bit of news this month was from the LOFAR project and the LOFAR team. So if you didn't see this in the news, LOFAR is the Low Frequency Array. It's an array of telescopes in the radio regime, which are across Europe, mostly in the Netherlands, but then also dotted around Europe as well, that are combined to make one giant radio telescope. And what it's been doing is surveying the northern sky in about 2.5 meter wavelengths, which is like 120 megahertz frequency waves. And what happened this month is they've uh, had their first data release of about 424 square degrees of the northern sky, which is actually only 2% of what they actually have planned to observe as well. So it's a tiny chunk of what this mission has planned. What they were able to do was from all those raw images was extract about 326,000 individual sources of radio emission in the sky. Everything from, um, you know, active galactic nuclei giving off in the radio to pulsars and star forming regions uh, in galaxies and say, this is where all those sources of radio emission are in the sky. And about 70% of those actually had uh, what we call an optical counterpart so that they could associate the radio emission with something that had already been seen in the optical or the visible wavelengths of light. So that was one bit of the story that really annoyed me when it was reported in the media because they were like 300,000 new galaxies found and it was like no because we've already seen them in the optical, we already knew they were there, the galaxies, it's just 300,000 now that we know that also have radio emission as well. So the new bit was the fact that they have this radio emission. So there was about 25 new astronomical journal papers released this month, either describing the data or the survey or how the reduction of the images were done. And then also some actually using the data to do some really cool science as well. For me, one of the coolest results came from Sabata et al. And that's because they were looking at these active galactic nuclei, galaxies where the supermassive black hole in the center 
is actually growing. So this is kind of close to my own research. I just tend to look in the optical rather than the radio. But they found that if you took a catalog of these active galactic nuclei and looked where the radio emission was, which of them had radio emission, they found that the highest mass galaxies always have radio emission from their supermassive black holes which generally tends to mean that they are growing, they are active, which is weird for us because we've been thinking for a long time that black hole growth is like stochastic, like it's on and off again, it's not something that's constant. Whereas this result is suggesting that actually that is constant, like it, the black hole is always accreting material and growing in the highest of mass galaxies, which is really interesting because we think that that feedback from that growth of the black hole can actually stop the galaxy from forming stars in the most massive galaxies. So it's really interesting to see that link there. And I think that's a really, really cool result. This is only 2% of the planned coverage of the sky though. And they said in one of the papers that actually the current amount of observing done is about 20% of the sky. So in the time that it took them to get the 2% and analyze and reduce everything and write that up, they've done another 18% worth of the observing that they're planned to do. And I was chatting to one of my friends in Oxford, Leia Morabito, who's on the LOFAR team, and she was telling me that the reason that the data reduction just takes so long is A, because of just sheer volume of data that they get off the sky, you know, a whole sky survey, they've got a lot to play with. But then also, the fact that the reduction is incredibly, incredibly difficult. And that's all to do with the fact that you get atmospheric effects ruining your data basically. So the same way that optical data can be ruined by the light traveling through the atmosphere and getting distorted. A similar thing happens in the radio, except that it's actually you get a faint emission of radio waves from the ionosphere as well, this sort of portion of the Earth's atmosphere. And unlike an optical thing where, you know, the images that I take in the optical with professional telescopes, they're like a 60th of a degree in size, and that's it, like one single exposure or pointing. Whereas with this radio telescope with LOFAR, one single pointing is like 20 degrees square of sky. Like it's a huge portion of the sky. And so you can't just model for one tiny section, you have to model for the atmospheric aberrations across that entire region of sky. Apparently the biggest bottleneck now though is actually just getting the images they've taken off the computer that they've archived them on. Like literally the images are so large and there is so much data that the bandwidth is obviously just not big enough to, to literally get them off the computer to work on them in enough time. What I'm really excited about though is that they're doing follow-up of all of these sources that they found uh, that have optical counterparts to them to be able to get really precise distances. So they're doing follow-up with the optical with a spectrograph, which is where you split the light from a galaxy through a prism and you get that sort of signature of its light and you can tell if it's been redshifted due to distance. And so at the minute, yes, they know the positions of all these galaxies, but they're not 100% sure on the distance. They can make educated guesses based on the optical light that comes from them as well, but they're not that precise. So the spectra follow-up using this instrument called WEAVE, which is gonna be on the William Herschel telescope in La Palma, a 4.2 meter optical telescope, will be really, really cool because then we'll have very precise distances for all of this radio emission as well, so we can study stuff in much greater detail. So the team are working on reducing all of that data now, so there should be even more results coming in the future, which I'm really excited about. So I just wanna say thanks to my friends, Ken Duncan and Leia Morabito, who are on the LOFAR team that chatted to me this week about how exciting these results were. Ken and I got particularly excited on Twitter because Chris Evans, aka Captain America, uh, noticed this story and tweeted about it. Uh, and then the two of us, along with a couple of other astronomers, had this amazing thread where we were just discussing how LOFAR had peaked and that all we ever wanted for an astronomical survey is for one of the Avengers to notice it. And perhaps Bruce Banner is just waiting for that spectroscopic follow-up with the weave uh, data before he gets involved. So pretty good month for astronomy-related news, if I'm quite honest. And uh, roll on March 2019 is all I can say. Oh, I forgot that this word plagues me so. Thule. 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 Ugh. Ugh. Oh, opportunity. I'm so sorry that I called you curiosity last week. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean to get the two of you confused. Oh, God, a 15 year long marathon. I die. Does anyone else remember the mission badges that NASA released for the Spirit and Opportunity missions as well? I remember them coming out in like 2003 when I was at school and thinking it was the coolest thing ever because they had like Marvin the Martian and like Daffy Duck on them. And I remember being like, oh my God, Marvin the Martian actually on Mars. 